Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Judas from Sovereign here. Love to have you all. We're right about to start. We're going to talk today with Big Al about his amazing article, Only the Strong Survive, asking why, asking and trying to answer, obviously, why is Bitcoin so unique? And does other cryptocurrencies uh, have any value? Do they, did they prove if they have any use case uh, and can it even happen so Iago is here Big Al is now joining us thank you very much for doing this and you know introduce yourself hey everybody um, is my uh, microphone working well here it is wonderful well uh, Iago Sovereign thank you for having me um, I always love speaking. Um, yeah, quick introduction myself. I am Big Al. That's my uh, pseudonym, obviously, not my real name. <laughs> I've been um, around in the space since around 2014. It came out of uh, my love of Bitcoin, came out of uh, a lot of game theory research I had been doing. Um, and since then, I've been obsessed. And so, you know, me and Alan, <clears throat> when it comes to this paper, Only the Strong Survive was... It was actually actually supposed to be only like 10 pages, much shorter. And then when we started writing it, we just couldn't stop writing. Um, and <clears throat> at one point, it was actually 72 pages long. So the shortened version is the one that's published of 48 pages. But it was really a work of love. It was, um, you know, with everything going on that we were seeing with DeFi, we came in really actually excited when we heard about decentralized finance because the concept is beautiful. Um, but then we started to find some issues with a lot of the ways that it is being, um, you know, put out today. And so we just thought we'd put our, you know, our thoughts into writing and, uh, you know, open to criticism and commentary to it. But the best way to do it is, you know, write something about it. So that's that's what we did. And I guess that's what we're here to, to speak about. So I think maybe, Big Al, we can do three steps here. Uh, I... Um... Uh, I think maybe it might be a good idea to highlight some of the key points uh, that you raise. I, I, a lot of people have, you know, you, 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 your paper made very, very significant waves. But um, for those who haven't read it, it might be a good idea to uh, summarize some of the key points. I think then also you guys yourselves uh, pointed out several ways in which you could be wrong. And I think it might be worthwhile exploring some of those and then i also think that you've had some uh thoughts and possibly criticisms around sovereign and its tokenomics and i think it'd be really interesting to discuss that i i love that you brought that last point up yago because i think that's going to be probably the most fun part of this conversation um and i want to be proven wrong in a public forum um <clears throat> but yes the the high level takeaways from the paper is like we went through a lot of steps, but the high level takeaways for us was that, you know, one, you have to look at the innovation of what happened from first principles and what, you know, to me and what we believe what Bitcoin truly is, is I think, you know, people call it, you know, new gold, digital gold, store of value. It can be all of those things, but <clears throat> that is not what Bitcoin is inherently. What Bitcoin is is the most secure settlement layer ever created by man, and it's built for the digital world in a rapidly digitizing world. And so what we wanted to do is first get that there, right? What were the principles? What makes it beautiful? Why is proof of work so important to allowing a fair system? And then as we dug into DeFi, I'm gonna, this is a very high-level summary because we go into a lot of different things, but um, it isn't finance. Inherently, what we are seeing is... Almost we took the worst parts of the average financial system and then we levered it up. We rehypothecated tokens that have no connection to real world value. Um, inherently, a lot of them advertise themselves as utility tokens. Utility tokens, you don't invest in iTunes gift cards or casino chips. You use them and then you cash them out. And so what we've seen is essentially basically... You know, if you look at the Atlantic big crisis, you look at the real estate crisis in the United States, at least there were homes backing these things. And in, in, in what we're seeing in DeFi right now, it's, it's, it's not really backed by anything in the real world. No lumber company is using these markets to build a home. It's, 
it's it's creating, in my opinion, a lot of what we've seen, not everything, but a lot of what we've seen is really dangerous because I think we almost took the worst parts of um, what we see in the current financial system and almost like levered it up and put it in a bull market and made everyone have FOMO. And that's what we were saying. And um, I don't want to be too harsh. I can always be wrong. And Iago, I'm glad you mentioned that section because I'd love to go into why we could be wrong. And I'd love to hear from the audience and yourself why we could be wrong. But that's the very, the very high level of um, sort of what we get into. And we go into the details of why we feel that way. It is 48 pages long, so I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, I, I'll try and uh, summarize my reading of it. Uh, because I think it's very, um, uh, of, of the many things that have been written about Bitcoin, I would say this is one of the closest to my view and uh, probably to the view that we discuss frequently in Sovereign. So I think starting out with what you said around, like what is the innovation of Bitcoin, you, you, you called it the, um, the world's most secure settlement layer. And we, I think, have described it differently in Sovereign, um, but I think it's different words referring to the same thing. Um, what we have often described Bitcoin as the central innovation around Bitcoin is the invention of uh, digital property rights, uh, borderless and cryptographically secured. And, um, and so when we talk about settlement, you're talking about the transfer of property rights. And, uh, and so we, we sort of place the emphasis on the property rights, you place the emphasis on the transfer, but ultimately you need both of those things. This property that you can't transfer is not property at all. Um, the one thing that we do point out, and it, I think we, we tend to make explicit and that you have more implicit in, your, in the paper, but that you sort of, that you, you do see to touch on, is that Bitcoin is like a special case, right? So Bitcoin has created digital, invented this concept of digital property rights. Um, but in the special case, right? Specifically for a single asset, which is BTC. And the, one of the things that I think is the dream, even if they don't really understand that this is what they're trying to do in smart contract platform world, right, is generalized at principle to um, maybe all kinds of property rights and certainly to many more types of property. Um, and then I think the other thing that you guys point out, which is very aligned with the, the, the way we think, is um, what really separates Bitcoin from everything else is its reliability. And if you want to have reliable property rights, you need to build them on, on a system which is going to be reliable, not just today, but into the far, far future. And what provides for that reliability is um, the proof of work uh, and the decentralization, or the way we often describe it as that Bitcoin has created maybe the world's most perfect vetocracy, right? So anyone can, almost anyone can veto a change, it's very hard uh, for, for, for anyone to impose a change. And that is what um, sort of uh, makes the system unmanipulable uh, and therefore reliable and credibly neutral. And basically every other system, and certainly proof-of-stake systems, that's the first thing that they give up. It's, Iago, in, I'm going to interject. It's such a beautiful point that you just brought up there. And if I, if I may use an analogy, I, I sometimes relate it to people. Um, it's, it's as if the Bitcoin network, I always separate the Bitcoin network from what a Bitcoin, the asset that you would purchase on Coinbase. Obviously, they're completely intertwined. But the Bitcoin network is almost like a judicial system. It's almost like the Supreme Court. You don't really want to deal with the Supreme Court. You don't want to ever really end up there, but you know it is there and it's secure and it's robust. And I would say this is probably even more robust than the United States Supreme Court. But you can relate the different chains or something like that to more of like a, a Soviet Union type court. And I know on the long run which one I'd want to bet on because if you're going to build an economy, like what you guys are trying to do at Sovereign, in my opinion, is almost build an economy, a new economy, a digital economy. And I think that's the goal of a lot of Bitcoiners and what we're in the 10 year or 20 year vision is that we're building it. We need that judicial system to be rock solid. That's what allows a monetary asset to have value. 
is that it always starts for the history of civilization. You need a rock solid judicial system and then a monetary floating point asset comes out of that. And that is a Bitcoin. That's what we invest in or people buy and hold. Right. And I think that that's why I'm such a stickler about the base layer being so secure. But it's a beautiful point you brought up. Sorry to interject there. Yeah, no, exactly. So I think, you know, we, 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 uh, I think uh, we, we, or we've come to the same conclusion. So, like you talk about it as a judicial system, we tend to refer to it as as, um, as a global institution, right? Um, and, uh, and 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 uh, a borderless institution. So, you know, I think Bitcoin is a monetary institution, and one of the things that we think we 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 can do with, you know, through the work that we're doing as sovereign is make it more than just a monetary institution, right? Build the economy around this, this, this monetary institution and add on additional layers uh, other types of institutions. And that's another thing that you guys point out in the paper, right? The, that, uh, that the way to grow the system is not on the base layer, which needs to, because, specifically because it's a monetary system, it needs to be extremely uh, simple and very, very difficult to change. Um, but that, you know, uh, 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 other, uh, on different layers, Lightning Network, RGB, Sovereign, etc., we can build additional institutions that trustlessly integrate with that it, uh, monetary layer. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. What you guys are doing at Sovereign, the other people you mentioned, like Lightning or, you know, um, even sta anything that, you know, it's, it's exactly right because it's – I, I admire the entrepreneurial attitude that we've seen on other chains where it's sort of almost like a move fast and break things. I think the mistake they're making is that they're doing it on their base layers. Whilst um, what we should embrace on our layer twos are these ideas that we could, you know, we can learn from other ecosystems that have flourished from being very easy to code, very easy to program. So I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I've always admired the uh, companies that are, are using this layer two whilst keeping the layer one completely robust. Yeah, um, exactly. And then I think, you know, the, the third part you described, and I'll just also just point out in my own words, the, 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 the issue right now with um, DeFi and this is not true of all DeFi, but it's true of probably the most DeFi, is that it's extremely self-referential, and it's, it's effectively a layering of speculative risk uh, in very, very opaque or difficult to understand ways. Uh, so, you know, the number one metric people think about today in DeFi is TVL. Um, and, you know, I think you guys probably did the best. It was an article that I wanted to write, write and you guys wrote it. Right, the best description of how TVL today is just basically a pyramid of rehypothecated uh, assets. And what rehypothecation means basically is you take an asset, right, and you wrap it up as a. Uh, the, the, the new term for rehypothecation is wrapping, right? So you take one asset and you wrap it as another <laughs> asset and you wrap it as another asset. And it's sort of. They'll come up with a of, new word to make it sound better. <laughs> Every month there'll be a new yeah. word to make it sound better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it reminds me of that uh, Winston Churchill quote uh, um, describing the Soviet Union as a um, as a mystery uh, 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 boxed in a uh, question mark wrapped in a uh, enigma. Uh, <laughs> I love it. And um, yeah, so 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 you know it. it and it's a lot. The the degree to which it seems to be attached to. So, you know, you guys raised the question, like, what is, e what is finance even? Why, why do we have such a thing? And how is it different from economic activity? So economic activity, the way I define it is, like, what we're building now, right? Like, you, 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 someone makes a car, you buy the car, and you buy the petrol to make the car go. That's economic activity. But finance is about financing the future. It's about, you know, mm -hmm. allocating resources into the future. And so the question is, what resources are being allocated in decentralized finance. Now, I wouldn't say it's nothing. Um, it's certainly a lot of the resources being allocated to funding projects that are being built in the future, right? Uh, ICOs finance a great deal of uh, development and innovation. Um, but uh, uh, 
a lot of um, what it is financing is, is more financing, right? The, <laughs> it's like, yo, dog, I heard you liked financing, so I put some financing on your financing. Um, and so, and so that, that, that's an issue as well, uh, and, and it becomes very, very brittle. It, it, it also, Yago, it becomes very, very dangerous, when you're, you, you, you described it beautifully, financing and debt and the that is actually what shows, you know, in historical and civilization is that having a strong financial sector and monetary base, being able to lend debt and we can call it rehypothecate is actually OK as long as it's funding real economic activity. But as we went through the onion layers of this, and we were really excited when people were saying, oh, it's DeFi, because DeFi, again, as a concept is beautiful. But what we saw was it was just layers of financing to finance other things to finance other things. It was just tokens being traded for tokens to yield the same token. And like it was like, well, where's where's the connection to anything here? Like where 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 where's the connection to any real world value? Like where's the connection to economic activity? And that's really, really dangerous when you just start layering finance and finance and finance. And look, in this market, when the Central banks, we don't have to have a macroeconomic talk here, but, you know, everything is basically in a bubble and everyone knows it because the central banks have been printing money since the, the Great Recession of uh, 2008 and they were only doing more during COVID. But when that ends, you know, these kind of layered things, at the end of the day, economic activity is what matters, right? And financing is a huge part of economic activity. It's very important that countries are able to have debt, have yields to finance future projects. What we got terrified of is that there was no there there. There was no end. It was just finance layered on finance. So I'll stop there. But that, that's my quick response to you, Yago. I think you did a very nice job of, of connecting economic activity versus just financing. Cool. So maybe uh, what could be a good idea at this point is um, there's the last, I mean, it's not the last uh, part of it. It's towards the very end, you, you talk about ways in which you could be wrong. And I'd like to get to that, but maybe before that, um, there might be people here who would like to um, ask a question or two. So maybe maybe you can field a couple of questions and then we can get to uh, ways in which you could be wrong. I would love that. Um, anyone, please speak up. I'm not very intimidating. You're probably all very much smarter than me, so please. <laughs> People are so drawn up in the conversation that so far no one has uh, requested to speak. So come on, guys, you're going to be the first. It, this this has never happened so so far it, inside the conversation. So I guess people are really uh, into Well, everything. look, if there are no questions, we we could we could go to yeah. How, I think so. how big L might be might be wrong, right? So <clears throat> I, I'd like to start with the the the, the fundamental claim that you guys make. Right, the, the very first thing that you make, which is that um, Bitcoin is uh, the most reliable, the most neutral asset, and um, proof of work provides the highest degree of security, and that's why Bitcoin will win. And I think that's. Um, Probably, you know, the least uh, refreshing take that you guys have in terms of like, like I think that's common, <laughs> common uh, uh, a belief uh, in many Bitcoin circles. Um, but it's also the first thing that you guys point out, like your first bullet point is you say we may have overestimated or simply been wrong about crypto's technical flaws. Right. And by crypto, you guys mean, you know, smart contract platforms and all of these other Ethereum and, and other related chains and underestimated its social strengths, and that ever-growing inflows of capital, talent, and interlinked network effects may contribute to overcoming whatever flaws exist, and the problems are successfully engineered around. Now, you, you, that's a very short paragraph, which I think, um, uh, in Bitcoin circles, demands uh, or should receive a, 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 high, a much greater degree of respect. And... The reason I say that is because um, the history of man is not the history of sound money beating out unsound money, right? The history of history, right? Throughout history, what we've seen is actually exactly the opposite. 
we've seen that over time, uh, money tends to be corrupted. Mm -hmm. And so the, the common argument that Bitcoin will win because it is the least corrupt or the best form of money, I find uh, a fairly weak argument. Uh, maybe uh, even a very weak argument. And uh, I, I'd like to sharpen this and sort of get your reaction. And I would go so far as to say that corruption, when it comes to money, is not a bug, but a feature. So uh, today, uh, you know, in crypto Twitter, people are often complaining. Jack Dorsey recently complained that all of these projects are, you know, being funded by uh, and therefore are subject to the interests of VCs. Uh, VCs are, you know, they're out for money, but they're not the worst people in the world, right? Yep. What happens when governments, uh, large corporations, uh, Facebooks, etc., look around and say, look, it's, uh, it's, it's obvious that these... Um, that stablecoins are going to be important, that cryptocurrencies are going to be important, that the settlement layer for the global economy is going to be some kind of cryptographic public ledger. Do we want it to be the credibly neutral and impossible to control Bitcoin, or are we going to, in, the, in many different ways, throw our weight behind something else, an Ethereum, mm -hmm. a Solana, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so... Uh, the, 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 the feature there is, you know, proof of stake in a way is a feature because a, a, a relatively small number of existing elites can transition to a proof of stake world without anything really having to change for them. Well, you, Yaga, you went through a lot of points there. And um, I'll, I'll, on, the, on the last point, uh, not only can they transition to a proof of stake world, it actually benefits them. Because it's an oligarchy then, right? If you own more, you get more of the inflation. But let's not talk about that. Because what I want to say is I want to be honest about where we could be wrong. I have um, an immense amount of friends or people I consider friends and people I speak to who you know, work on these other chains. And they're extraordinarily intelligent, uh, probably more intelligent than myself by a mile. And when, when you know, one of the lines in that sentence... Um, that we wrote was underestimated social strengths is that, for example, one of the bullets we also talk about is, you know, we could have built the internet differently, but the UI and everything that the way that Facebook and Google sort of conquered it or Google essentially conquered the internet was that they made it very easy. And that the truth is, is that, you know, humans want utility and they want it to be easy. And that is perfectly fine. And that's perfectly okay. So what we're talking about here is that, you know, us being sticklers on the layer one is that maybe we're just wrong that, you know, so many apps are developed on, let's let's say Ethereum, that people love and use, that they, they hold Ethereum, they actually hold it, even though technically you would just use it as a utility token, it should just be inventory, so you shouldn't hold value, but let's not get into that. Um, but that we're wrong on that sense, that humans, like you said, historically, money gets corrupted. And as long as the UI and the design is nice, they win simply because they've made it easier. Because, frankly, my view of Bitcoin and my view of hopefully where we go to a fairer world, which I think it's going to have a huge place in the world, is that um, people need to use it without even knowing they're using it. Like, that's why I've always admired Strike is that like they've designed this platform where people don't even know they're using Bitcoin, like the Lightning Network as a base layer. Like that's that's where this, if, if in five to 10 years we're not building applications where people don't even know they're using Lightning on the back end, they're just using a platform that allows micropayments and gaming and all that good stuff, like what Zebedee is doing, a brilliant company there, um, is it, that's where we could be wrong. Is that simply that, you know, it's my little, yeah, I'm going to share it with the audience here. My little brother, he did a, he uh, skipped his first semester of college because um, he had, um, it was COVID, right? So why go to, you know, it's just weird to go during the middle of COVID. And he did a hacking boot camp and he learned Solidity in two weeks. So it's funny enough, I published this paper, but my little brother is making money coding stuff on Solidity and helping that. And so if they get the brain share and they actually develop 
develop apps that people actually use. And, and, and this is really important. I'm going to stop after this sentence here. But if people actually develop apps that people use, not just to trade tokens, not to, if it just continues to be tokens traded for other tokens, I'm going to continue to have my point that it's all going to fall apart in the economic crisis that will come. Um, but if they develop utility apps, frankly, most people won't care. If it's on Ethereum that you can send money to your family overseas instantaneously with very little fees instead of using Western Union, people won't care if it's on Ethereum or not. So that's my right. to my argument. Right. And so my favorite, um, I, I think it's very illustrative to draw scenarios which feel concrete, which, you know, not, not just say this could happen, but sort of tell a story of how it could happen. And so my... Currently, my favorite story of explaining how what you just said happens in a way which um, today would be uh, unattractive for Bitcoin, right? Would reduce the chance of Bitcoin uh, becoming a base layer for tomorrow's economy is this. Um, a large number of game companies... Uh, recognize that there's a substantial uh, opportunity to monetize by introducing um, interoperable or NFT type uh, game in-game assets. Uh, this is not so different from what games are ready to do today, right? So free-to-play um, and in-game purchases are the driving mechanism of the vast majority of game revenue today, which is a much larger, it's the largest entertainment industry by far in the world. It's a yeah, huge, huge multi-billion dollar industry. And um, these uh, 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 game companies uh, recognize the opportunity, which they already seem to be doing, and they introduce hundreds of millions of people, not to cryptocurrencies, but to other types of uh, private digital property in the form of in-game assets, fungible or non-fungible. Uh, and then these are traded for cryptocurrencies. And what ends up happening in a very, very short space of time, this could happen in you know, the blink of an eye, is that hundreds of millions of people around the world have uh, wallets that they use on a day-to-day -day basis because they're using them in in-game environments where they spend a huge amount of their time. They're very familiar with. They're very, very easy to use. And um, uh, it becomes, you know, the focal point of their economic life. And already we're seeing this happen. In the Philippines, you can go to malls and pay with your Axie Infinity uh, in-game currency. Um, and so people are you know, used to having that as their mobile, you know, their crypto wallet is their mobile wallet on their mobile phone. And so you could imagine a situation in which hundreds of millions of people are using for true economic activity, both in the physical realm and in the online realm, uh, wallets uh, which have no connection to Bitcoin. Uh, and that's their primary introduction to crypto. They don't even think of it as crypto. They just think of it as, as their, you know, digital um uh, wallet. I think I love that you brought up gaming because it's something that I've been looking into. Um, the beauty of let's I'm going to say the Lightning Network. I know there are other networks, but the beauty of it is that actually, if you want to do microtransactions in gaming, let's say that like if like my vision, um, we obviously are going to digitalize world. I completely agree with all the trends you're saying. Is that actually the Lightning Network is programmed better? to make that happen because microtransactions are actually possible on that with very, very low fees. That's actually really not the case today on almost any chain. But I agree with you. And I think what we're going to see is that I've seen it from, it's a funny dynamic because, and let's not get too far into it, but like the gamers have had actually a massive pushback. Um, there's been a lot of hate against this sort of NFT. They've been huge flops on like Call of Duty and whatnot. No one's bought them. The gamers don't like it. But what they do like is something like what, you know, again, I'm mentioning a company. I don't want to, you know, shill a company or anything like that. But like something what Zebedee is doing where 
you just integrate it in and it's like micro payments. Like if you shoot the McDonald's ad on Call of Duty, you get a couple sats streamed to you. And that's how I think it's going to look. And those sats can be streamed in Bitcoin or they can be immediately, in, basically instantly transferred into a stable coin. And that can all be done on the back end. And the thing is that actually what people underestimate is that the best network to build it on and the easiest programming games is very difficult. Amazon failed. Like Amazon tried to get into gaming and failed. If Amazon fails, I think people have to understand creating good games is a very, very difficult business. Um, it's very difficult on the programmers. I've spoken to them. They they get upset because their boss are like, oh, get get us into blockchain. Get us into this. And they're like, what, what the hell does that mean? Like building a blockchain game. Like what, what does that mean? Like, <laughs> like, let me just build my game. But if you can just make it so that you can do microtransactions, which is what gamers want to do, maybe we'll bet on, like, um, I'm going to use Call of Duty because it's a game. I don't play very many games. That's a game I played growing up. Um, if we have, like, a battle, like a team battle, the team that wins gets sat streamed to them and or, you know, that type of thing. It needs to be obfuscated away from the user. And what's beautiful about the Bitcoin network is that, and especially the Lightning network, is that it's actually the best network to build it on. It's the easiest. They can integrate it in one week. And I've seen case studies and proof points of it. Advertisers love it. Gamers love it. Gamers don't want to be have NFTs shoved down their throat. NFTs, and like what you just said, this has existed for a very long time. Like, just use AWS. You don't, don't use a blockchain. Like, if you own an asset in World of Warcraft, that's owned for, that, that's a very well, that's a very well-known thing. Like, that's existed forever, Right. I mean, even Vitalik, you know, he makes the joke that he created Ethereum because he won his World of Warcraft sword or something, and he couldn't, like, fungibly trade it or whatever. But, like, yeah, no, th these ideas that are coming up in this new hype cycle on gaming, these aren't solving the issues. And actually, it, there's been massive pushback from the gamers on this. I'm not sure where it's going to go, but I think, um, I hope I'm being clear here, but I think that... The Light Network enables the transactions. It can also enable the NFTs in the future if they would like that, but it enables these instantaneous micropayments for you to compete. And guess what? Users love it. That's the case study. But what users don't love, and this is also proof points, you can Google it, they do not love the NFT stuff. I mean, the Call of Duty stuff was a total flop, and gamers are not happy with like this sort of introduction of, like, pay to play type of because it's like it's free but they have to pay for the people actually there's been a lot of pushback from the community so that's my response there yago i, I hope that was clear i'm happy to dig into sure that. I, I i i i i would say you know i uh, don't necessarily agree with uh, i think i probably disagree with most of what you said but um, uh, i i'd like to point out that my point wasn't specifically that gaming is going to, you know, uh, transition to Ethereum or whatever. Rather, what I was trying to do is illustrate um, a way, right, just so that we would have sort of like a concrete way in which we could imagine um, a, a economy, right, a true economy, growing up where Bitcoin was not a core part of the loop, right, so that... Uh, uh, because the, the, the central point that I think it's important to make is that while Bitcoin has huge advantages and um, uh, is clearly the current leader, that um, treating Bitcoin as inevitable is a mistake on the part of the people who want to see Bitcoin succeed. I don't think uh, that, that, you know, it's um, one of the, the difficult things that we need to do is to keep two ideas in mind at once. One, that Bitcoin is going to succeed, but two, that Bitcoin is only going to succeed if we make it succeed, right? Uh, and um, I think that one of the problems that we've had... Uh, since basically the block size wars uh, has been a emphasis of the fact that Bitcoin is going to succeed and we need to treat Bitcoin as so inevitable and so unchanging that um, uh, we, 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 uh, we, we need to double down on 
you know, the same ideas that we had in 2016. And I think a perfect example of this is the Lightning Network. Right? So Lightning Network is starting to pick up some traction, but that traction is very minimal. And as someone who has been involved in working with Lightning Network pretty much from the beginning and has been involved with teams who are developing on Lightning Network, I can tell you that it is extremely limited in many ways and very, very difficult to work with. One of the ways in which Lightning Network, just as an example, again, because it's, it's good to have sort of concrete examples. <clears throat> Let's say you want to send these microtransactions uh, to um, a large number of users, right? You need to have a way of routing to them, which means that all of these users need to have inbound uh, uh, um, uh, channels, right? It's not that you as a user go and connect with the game or the exchange or the service that you're using and you put some sets in so that you can send them money. It means that you need to have someone who's connected to you, right? Big Al and little Teddy and, and Johnny, Four Eyes, all of them, right? Everyone needs to have inbound liquidity. That is a very, very difficult problem. And it's, it's one, of the, with one of the challenges of the Lightning Network, which is not easy to solve. I... Um... I think that, by the way, so I might have misconstrued what you were getting out on the gaming, so I appreciate the, we, we can have some, you know, back and forth outside of this on, on where it's going, but I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think that we are seeing companies solve this, and this is going to be, this is going to be maybe controversial. I'd love to hear from a, from a, um, from a listener or from yourself, of course, Yago, is that, like, I think that there are companies that are solving this which almost maybe centralize that sort of yes. layer, too. And that yeah. is okay with me because you know what it is? It's a choice. Humans don't – not everyone needs to wear a tinfoil hat and live in rural and have, like, their machine guns and, like, their bitcoins buried in the sand. That's it's okay. It's okay as long as the layer one is robust. But I think that these – what I admire about these layer two companies that they're realizing is that, like, they'll create the wall for you. They'll provide the liquidity, and it will be okay. And that's okay with the user. So I, I want to make that point clear, too. I'm not, you know, <laughs> I live yeah. in a big city, not to dox myself. I'm not living in some rural farm like, with my guns. I've never shot a gun. I'm not one of those, like, tinfoil hat guys. It just, it just is, you know, it's fine. If you are that, that's fine. That's, uh, there's no judgment on my part. It's just I agree with you, I think, Yago. I think that we might disagree on some of the nuances, but I agree with your larger statement. I didn't mean to, to, to miss, um, misrepresent what right. you uh, said. Yeah, so I think, you know, th th this is one of the things which concerns me, right, is there's been a retreat, I think, um, in um, certain, in, in, in Bitcoin thinking, right, in the thinking of Bitcoiners. Um, a retreat to, it's okay to rely on centralized services to provide us with uh, to plug the holes, right? So examples of this are uh, what you just mentioned with the Lightning Network. Um, but it goes beyond that. It's like, uh, you know, people who will say, um, you know, we don't really need decentralized exchanges because exchange is decentralized. There's 20 or 30 or 100 exchanges. So, you know, that's not centralized. Um, and uh, uh, people who will say, you know, we don't need uh, decentralized uh, lending because, uh, uh, um, you know, we, we uh, can uh, go to many, many different uh, lending uh, uh, services. And people who say we don't need tokens because uh, we can uh, set up our company in, in, in the Caymans, right? We don't, need, doesn't, we don't need to set the company up according to uh, U.S. law. We can set it up uh, under some other law. So we don't really need to have um, borderless uh, 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 ways of, of, of creating tokens that, that we can use for, for governance or revenue or, or anything like that. And so there's this, there's this retreat to basically say, look, all of these things that are being built outside uh, of Bitcoin in the smart contract platform world, uh, we could just do it in a, uh, with centralized uh, 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 parties because, you know, uh, the fact that there's more than one party, that provides us with the decentralization that we want. And that seems to be a very strange sort of, you know, argument for, for us to be making. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, 
look, it goes back to the paragraph one of what we wrote, and, and I'll, it was just for the audience. I don't expect anyone this, you know, I wrote it, and I don't think I even read the whole thing. Um, but <laughs> the the beauty of this and what, what, what the innovation is at first principles, it's all about trust. Do you really trust the centralized organization? And if you do, then that's okay. It works better. There's a reason block, blockchain has been theorized since I believe – uh, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was theorized in 1991. No one adopted it because it's an inefficient form of database. It's What we've done here is we've created a network where you can trust the validation. And it, it goes to the beginning of our conversation about, you know, I call it a settlement layer. You know, you do it with property. It's fine how we divine it. But it goes to first principles. And if you give away those first – it's not like we're going to solve, like – we're not going to cure cancer with Bitcoin. I mean, it has its place in the world. And the, the place in the world, which I think is beautiful, especially in a rapidly digitalizing world, is a digitally native settlement layer that, you know, people can trust. They don't have to trust their local government. They don't have to trust. They can just trust software. And I think that's that's always been my view on it. And I, I hope that was a good response to sort of what you were getting at. But, yeah. Right. So I think, I think that the challenge is – with that is that it's true that you you might be able to trust your service provider uh, but the service provider exists in a environment uh, where you know they have their own service providers and they have the laws and regulations that they need to operate under and can you really trust uh, those and um, and I think that the the answer obviously has to be no. Otherwise, what are we doing here, right? So, uh, you know, you've got your uh, little uh, uh, local credit union or your local bank, right? And you trust them, and they're they're you know mom and pop bank. Such a thing still exists, right? And you've got a great relationship with them, and then the global financial crisis happens, and they're the only ones who go under. Uh, because mm-hmm. they're not too big to fail, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, this is this is a real thing that happened more than once, right? So, and it was through no fault of their own, right? So the 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 um, you know beautiful thing about Bitcoin, among other things, is that it's nobody's liability. Um, but it's it's nobody's liability because it's based on a system which uh, isn't reliant. Uh, on any other institution for for its instantiation and for its ongoing reliability. And I think that that is a very important uh, and powerful concept that, again, we can generalize. Uh, and to my mind, you know, the, the, the biggest change that I would like to see in the way Bitcoiners think is we've got this amazing innovation, right? Um, how do we generalize? Right? First, let's understand what it is. And I, there's a reason I point to, to, to property rights, because property rights are effectively the institution of property rights. Right? And yep. in a digital, borderless world, uh, you want them to be digital. And in any world, you want them to be nonviolent. And, and cryptography, you know, nothing empowers the individual more than cryptography. It's, like, and it's the, the most asymmetric power in the world, right? Yep. Um, and, and so, so we have one really pristine type of, of, of private property that exists with this, uh, with with you know with the, with these borderless, cryptographically protected, um, self custodial properties. How can we generalize that further? And I think that um, not that, that we as Bitcoiners should be thinking about that. Not first of all because. For the same reason we like it with Bitcoin, we would like it with everything else. But second, if we can construct a world using that logic, Bitcoin would sit firmly at the very center of that world. I, I think I, I think you just you said it very beautifully, um, and I, I don't think I have much to add because I think you you said it beautifully there. And I do want to I do want to push you. I would love to have a little debate about sovereign. And why you why uh, a token you felt the token was necessary if if you're comfortable with that I know it's a little outside of me <laughs> no no, no. I, think this is the, I think this is the perfect segue right so like yeah. I've just made an argument for which what effectively is my argument for sovereign mm-hmm. uh, so why am I wrong 
Let's go. Let's let's go. <laughs> Are we talking well, about maybe why you're wrong, why am I? I may be wrong. No, I, I you know, if if I may, if I may put the ball on your court, why the token? What does it enable? Is it is it because People do work on incentives. It's important that you incentivize developers and whatnot to build out your sovereign ecosystem. But, but I, I, why the token and why does someone hold the token? Like, do, do they? I think hearing it from your words would, would would help you know stir stir that debate because I've seen a lot of projects who who don't do a token, and because they can just use Bitcoin and they can use Lightning Network as the underlying you know sort of payment rail there. So. I would almost pose the question to you if that's okay with if that's okay with you, Yago. Sure, definitely. I think it's a great question, and it's one of the core questions that we need to answer. So, on the highest level, I would say uh, that you know, one of my goals, right, that I think we should be striving to achieve is hyper Bitcoinization. What does hyper Bitcoinization mean? For a lot of people, hyper Bitcoinization means uh, everything, all assets sort of collapse into Bitcoin, right? Real estate, all of its value gets sucked into Bitcoin. Gold, all of its value gets sucked into Bitcoin. Uh, bonds, all of their value gets sucked into Bitcoin. All currencies get sucked into Bitcoin. Bitcoin, uh, you know, all day, all long, you eat Bitcoin, you live in Bitcoin, Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, I see that as an extremely unlikely and probably... Uh, 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 um, unhappy if it were to ever happen uh, situation and, and the reason is you can't live in a bitcoin you can't eat a bitcoin um and um uh, sort of having this uh, non-productive asset being the only asset uh that uh, all, all all value accrues to would uh would not be good for innovation would not be good for growth uh, and would be extremely stultifying in terms of the the, the structure, uh, the power structure in society. Uh, I could see why people who have a lot of Bitcoin would think this is a lovely idea, but <laughs> I don't think it's a good idea. But yep. thankfully, thankfully, it's also not not a thing that's actually ever going to happen. And the reason it's not going to happen is because money is just one kind of asset. Money is the asset of of transmission. Right? It's how we transmit value between parties. And more uh, accurately, it's the asset of measurement. It's how we measure uh, um, very, very different things and, and can sort of uh, uh, provide them with a single metric of value. Right? That's, a, that's a very, very powerful tool. But there's many other types of assets out there which are extremely important and aren't going away. They're commodities. Right. Uh, there's uh, consumer goods. There's uh, 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 equities. There's a uh, debt instrument. Uh, we're going to need all of them. And so hyper Bitcoinization is not trying to turn everything into Bitcoin, but rather constructing all of these other asset classes so that the metric that they use, the yardstick that they use for the measurement of value is Bitcoin. The method of transmission of value between them is Bitcoin. And the logic, and this is the most important part, the logic upon which they're based is the logic of Bitcoin, which is to say the logic of self-custody, of transparency, um, and, and, and uh, 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 cryptographic borderless assurances, right? That's a hyper-Bitcoinized world in my mind. So that was a very, very big sort of uh, picture on. So now let's get into the details of what that means. So... The details of what that means is I think that we need to be able to construct um, uh, a tokenized world around Bitcoin. And that that would be very much to the benefit of Bitcoin if it was secured by Bitcoin and trustlessly interactable with Bitcoin. And then what you need to do is you need to start building a bunch of different institutions uh, to do different things. And these institutions have to be able to be manageable and have their own incentive structures. And these incentive structures are, in almost every single case, in fact, in every single case, going to look very different from Bitcoin's in in incentive structure. If the incentive structure does not look a bit different from Bitcoin's incentive structure, it's an altcoin, right? But That's only, only yeah. money, 
right, should be basically this unchangeable vitocracy, uh, which is what you use the decentralization in Bitcoin for. Other systems should look very different. So, for example, a layer two system needs to be able to change and adapt much more frequently. A system which is doing, you know, a true, you know, like governance or insurance or, uh, or, or a judicial court-like system, these all need to be able to adapt, change uh, with greater frequency uh, than Bitcoin. And, and so you need to have a, a system of governance. And so that's the primary purpose of having a token. But that token has to have value and has to be distributable. It has to be able to distribute value uh, because otherwise you can't incentivize good governance. And the structure of how you incentivize good governance is the key to whether or not you get any good governance at all. And how do you distribute that value? Well, you do it with Bitcoin. And so I think in a hyper-Bitcoinized world, what you have is a set of tokens which allow you to construct borderless institutions which aren't reliant on a particular government, so they can operate everywhere, they can be accessible and permissionless for everyone. They basically give property rights to anyone anywhere they are in the world. Uh, they, they are governed well because they have a good set of incentives and, um, and what people basically own is sort of like you know, equity 2.0 where what they're earning is the dividend in the form of Bitcoin. And that is exactly. exactly what SOV does. And so that's exactly, it's, uh, so I'm going to have a leading question, which I think you're going to hit out of the park, so I'm sure you've gotten this. If I were to purchase SOV token, the way I'm putting on my investor hat right now, would it look like almost a DCF on Bitcoin dividends? Is that the way you would view it as what SOV tokens enables? Of course, I, I understand your governance point, but I do want to pose that question. Like, if I put my investor hat on, I'm like, how do I value this? Yes, so the, yeah. the short answer is yes. The long answer is it's a little bit more complicated than that because um, tokens are programmable, and so people can use them, and we can use them in different ways. So, for example, projects that are building on Sovereign are sometimes binding their token to SOP so they can get governance rights in the system on which they're building, right, which helps increase the decentralization, but also means that there's sort of like a different set of demand which goes beyond what you would just see in a DCF system. But as a first approximation, I think, yes, DCF is the way to think about it. And by the way, for everyone listening, DCF means discounted cash flows, which means that when you do your analysis, you say, you know, okay, the system's going to make, you know, 10 Bitcoin in the first year and 20 Bitcoin in the second year and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then you discount the future flows because money today is worth more than money tomorrow. Okay, good. Um, okay, so here's, here's um, I guess my, my leading question is that if we're thinking, of, one of my questions with DeFi in general is that what we discussed is that finance is a way to, well, finance economic activity. Um, one of my concerns, and only the strong survive, was that None of this is actually financing real economic activity. Do you believe that what you're building was sovereign? Because even on your website, right, the first thing you say is we're building decentralized finance on Bitcoin. But if it's just to trade tokens and tokens to trade other tokens, I get a little concerned. Do you have a, do you have a response or a view to that, that like sovereign's goal is actually to be a capital market for productive economic like I'm talking, let's, let's use lumber. I love using the example of lumber companies, like something that like people use to build a house. You, do you view like the sovereign platform as enabling that in a better way, in a borderless and trustless way? Because that's always been one of my problems with DeFi, uh, as what I've seen today. A hundred percent, yes. So I think, in many ways, I think of Bitcoin as the boots on the ground cryptocurrency. Right? Uh, it's used by people around the world for their real economic means, and it's also secured by real activity in the form of proof of work. Uh, and it's a big part of why I think it's attractive. Now, with Sovereign, um, I think our first, you know, challenge, right, level one, is to unlock the uh, latent potential in the collateral. Uh, if you think of it like what Hernando de Soto said, you know, he said there's trillions of dollars. One of the reasons that the, the, the third world is poor is because <clears throat> they have trillions of dollars in 
real estate assets that they can't unlock. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, you've got a house uh, in a slum in outside of Lagos. You can't borrow against it to start a business. Uh, I think we have well over, you know, we, we have a trillion dollars worth of Bitcoin, which to a first approximation is dead capital. And so I think our first challenge is to unlock that debt capital. Then the question becomes, once that is unlocked and people are now able to start uh, to either leverage or borrow against that collateral, what can they do with it? And I think that there's a number of, of obvious things. One, you already mentioned, it's houses. So uh, there's work being done on being able to provide um, for mortgages uh, through the sovereign platform. Mm -hmm. um, there was already one uh, a team that is working on it that already secured. I think uh, I've met them. <laughs> yeah, I so, with so, them. so they, 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 they had already agreed uh, with, with, a, with a host nation to, to introduce this as sort of part of law. Uh, and then there was an election, and now there's a greater question. But the, 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 the work continues. But, you know, that, that, that's certainly, I think, you know, mortgages are one of the biggest markets in the world. There's another initiative uh, to do something similar, but for pensions. So imagine, you know, people in Honduras or people in, uh, you know, uh, Ghana would have access to pensions where they didn't need to rely on their government for the security of the pension. Right? It was... It was, it was um, programmatically secured. And so all you need to do for that is you, you need to have a structure where people uh, can, um, uh, you need to have a fiat on ramps, and so we have some fiat on ramps that people can use. And then there needs to be a way to earn yield on that and have that yield locked up for a long period of time. So that, that exists. Uh, all of those, those primitives exist for sovereign and, and now they're being put together. A, so that, that's sort of like um, you know, two very big markets. Uh, the second is closer and is happening now. So we've already seen a number of projects raise funds in order to build uh, on, the, um, on the ecosystem. One of them is Babelfish, which raised funds to develop um, better uh, stable coins. Uh, another one is Mint, which is building Bitcoin-backed stable coins. Mm -hmm. There's Topicus, who are providing lending across Latin America. And so that sort of equity or speculative, right, um, or you know, not speculative, but I would say high, you know, that's like, that's like classic finance, right? Like, let's try and allocate value to projects that could potentially uh, uh, solve real-world problems but would need an initial, uh, initial capital to do. Um, so... Uh, 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 I think that, 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 that there's that, and then there's the the, the third component, right, which is um, the introduction of Bitcoin backed stable coins themselves, allowing effectively everyone to have access to um, uh, dollar denominated asset or or some kind of maybe in the future it's not going to be dollars, but a, a stable transactional asset where they are relieved of the pressure of, um, uh, of volatility, but still have a truly decentralized, uh, truly um, uh, a, a censorship resistant way of transacting. And that can be done with Lightning Network as well. And so I think those are you know, three of the, the, the pieces that I'm seeing currently happen on, on Sovereign, which are very much boots on the ground type work. No, I, I love to hear that. No, those are really, really good examples. And when you think about what's currently happening on Sovereign, and, and disclose what you'd like, but when you think about a percentage of what's happening on Sovereign, are these very low percentages of what's happening on Sovereign? These are early stages. These are, you know, dreams that are being built out, or is this like a significant portion of, of sort of, of what you are seeing with regards to quote unquote DeFi on Bitcoin? Well, the first year of Sovereign, right? So Sovereign's been sort of live since about April, uh, so mm -hmm. ungated. So it's less than a year, and like substantial work has been done for about a year on Sovereign. 
So if you look at year one on Severin, it's been it's been like a fire hose, right? The the devs have, <laughs> have been the fire hose, and we, you know, as people who are using Severin and the Severins have been drinking from this fire hose of this construction of a massive amount of the basic pr financial primitives, so trading, lending, leverage, derivatives, uh, as well as uh, integrations with other chains uh, uh, and um, integration with fiat on ramps. In other words, integration with other economic uh, 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 worlds so that funds can flow both in and out, as well as you know UI uh, uh, um, uh, a huge amount of system testing. Um, um, but basically, <laughs> you know. Uh, infrastructure development, integration with Lightning Network. There's just been a huge amount of sort of like, I think one way to think about where Sovereign is, is like, uh, you know, when they start building the skyscraper next to you, right? I don't know if, if you live in a big city, you know what I mean, right? They, yeah. You, you, you yeah. hear they're going to build a skyscraper. The first year, what they usually manage to do is dig a hole. <laughs> it looks yep. extremely unimpressive. <laughs> like, you know, it's like they've made everything worse. <laughs> I think I think we we finally completed building the hole, uh, digging our hole, and, and 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 we've started to lay a lot of the foundations, and where we'll start to see now are exactly the, the you know the floors of the skyscraper are exactly these economic uh, uh, um, activity. Yeah, yeah. No, it it this. Um, I mean, there's a lot there. There's a lot you just described, and you know. Um, Again, I always love questions from the audience. One, and I, I'm, I'm repeating myself almost, but could you have done all of this without a token? And you knew I was going to ask that question. I'm sorry to ask that question in a public forum. But... <laughs> no, I, I think it's a great question. I don't know why you should be embarrassed uh, or, 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 or wary about asking. The simple answer is, uh, you know, there's this great Yogi Berra quote, right? Uh, in theory, there's no difference between practice and theory. But in practice, there is. <laughs> I know that quote. It's a beautiful quote. <laughs> so it's, it, it's one of my favorites. Right? Theoretically, we could have done all of this without touching. In practice, so look, uh, Rootstock as a technology has been around for years. Liquid as a technology has been around for years. Lightning Network, people started working on it in 2014. I was there, right? I mean, I was in the room where we first proposed. Uh, mm -hmm. That's seven years ago. <laughs> We're getting old. We're getting old, Iago. <laughs> um, we haven't seen the kind of traction that we should in any of the uh, 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 developments. Not, not one. Right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, since April, Sovereign has done over $2 billion in transactions has built out a huge amount of infrastructure, has attracted a great deal of interest, has built out a, a, a dev community of multiple different independent teams working on multiple different projects, some of which are going to succeed, uh, um, has facilitated trading, lending. I've made, I, I, I you know, like my primary use for, for Sovereign is, is I try to get more Bitcoin. And so I've managed to stack sets on Bitcoin and I've, by lending, and I've managed to sort of lever up my Bitcoin uh, fairly conservatively. But as a result, I've just grown the amount of Bitcoin I have. This is, for me, true economic activity. Huh? <laughs> um, I'm slightly jealous of you. Um, but yes, I, I hear you on that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so um, I think we need to get past our phobia of tokens. It's it's it it's 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 bad for Bitcoin. It's bad for Bitcoin in two ways. First of all, it doesn't allow us to create the right incentives to get the best people uh, to be able to raise the kind of money that they need in order to go out there and kick us. Mm -hmm. And it's. The second reason it's bad for Bitcoin is because it, it, get, it makes us confused about what we're trying to achieve. Profit motive, that, right? That's quite the statement. That's quite the statement. Uh, right? I, like, uh, we, we've, we've become so suspicious of the profit motive. 
Now, yeah. I get it, right? But but we're we're the, the the point is not to be suspicious of the profit motive. The profit the, the thing we should be suspicious of is the seniorage motive, mm -hmm. right? So altcoins, competing cryptocurrencies, their shtick has been look. You, you, you like money? I like money. Let's make money. How are we going to do it? Just make, pay money, right? That, that, that we should be extremely sensitive to. I agree, right? But that's not what most, even today, most tokens, even outside of the Bitcoin ecosystem, are no longer trying that. Right? that that's a, you know, Solana is still doing it, and, you know, Avalanche is still doing it. So some of the biggest names today are still doing it, but the vast majority of them have moved past it. And then the third thing, and I think this is the worst part of it, is it doesn't provide us with a, 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 um, a rational, realistic path to hyper-Bitcoinization. We need to have an economic structure that trustlessly can interact with Bitcoin, or Bitcoin is going to become sort of like just gold 2.0. And, and uh, you know, gold, gold 1.0 didn't provide us with the value that we needed. It was too easy uh, uh, to corrupt. It was too easy to disengage from it. Yeah, and, you know, I've, I've asked some pretty leading questions, and, you know, for me, I want to close with the fact on when I think about Layer 2s and when I think about where Bitcoin needs to go, um, I always have a suspicion of tokens. But your response, I actually agree with it, funny enough. I agree with your response to it, and I think that what we need to realize is that we already have the most robust Supreme Court. We need to get more entrepreneurial, and we need to understand profit incentives. And I love that quote. I might steal it from you. How did Bitcoiners become communists? Um, so it's a beautiful quote. So, you know, the reason I ask the leading questions is because of, obviously, my paper shows suspicions on what DeFi actually provides today, and especially on a lot of the tokens, like 98% or 99% that are out there when you actually, like, go through the onion layers um but you know for me look i from a from a from the the idea and what you're trying and what you're pushing to do is exactly what bitcoin needs because we've we've built this beautiful supreme court i'm gonna keep calling it that we've built this beautiful supreme court the fairest ever for the digital world now let's build on it and let's have entrepreneurs build on it so i, I want to close with that um I know there there's some people in this chat. Yeah, I don't know if you have anything anything there. We're a little over our, our hour mark here, but you know, again, I'd love to hear from anybody who, again, Yago and I are not scary people, so please ask us any questions. <laughs> but that's what I want to say uh, to to sort of close off my my line of questioning on sovereign as a token. Judas, you can uh, start adding. I think David and Martin. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm just real. Sorry, I'm really bad with technology. Funny enough, all right. I just added a bunch of requests. Um. <laughs> um. Um. Hello, guys. Hi. Is that uh, yes. David? Yes. Thank you for having me. Um. Just wanted to start off with. Uh, really enjoyed the discussion. I mean, every once in a uh, well, very often actually, on this community, um, the conversation just goes on the next level, and it's so refreshing to see like content about talking about crypto um that goes beyond um like the trading price speculation thing and just go take the discussion on their level so just wanted to appreciate uh thank you guys for for a talk uh, that was pretty much it actually Th thank you david i i'm glad that's how it came across okay uh i'll go ahead uh i'll you know, good to chat with you again, um, Yago, uh, Judas, everybody. Thanks for hosting the call. Um, so I, I was kind of hoping to see some some fireworks fly on this call and, and have like kind of a, a little bit of a hostile debate. But it sounds like you guys are, are almost generally on, on, on the same page. So my question now becomes is, is you know, how do we open this narrative up to, to more Bitcoiners? Because, you know, Big Al, like whenever I talk about your, your paper, kind of, you know, like the conference that we were at, like, you know, everybody else touts your paper as saying, oh, wow, see, all shit coins are bad. And I read your paper and I go, no, 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 that, that, that's not right. That's not what they're saying. They're, they're not saying that DeFi is bad. They're not saying that all tokens necessarily are bad. There's nuance to it. And I think you guys kind of hit on those points in this call. But how do we kind of open up that nuance and really kind of shine a light on it to the rest of the Bitcoin community? Because it, it, it's almost like people see what they want as opposed to necessarily what you were saying. Um, so I don't know. I'd be curious if you guys can riff off that a little bit. 
I'll give a quick response. I think Yago might have a, a better one. Look, the truth is, it's similar. You know, I, I do stuff in the mining space. We have to deal with all the ESG stuff, even though we're funding out clean energy that normally needs your tax money to be paid for. But it's one of those things where I think doing discussions like this, publishing papers, is eventually the truth comes out and eventually the value comes out. And oftentimes it actually takes a bear market um, for people to realize where value really lies because when the tide comes out, the emperors, you'll see who's wearing clothes and who isn't, right? Does the emperor wear clothes or not? And so um, it, it's, I, I don't, I can't solve it tomorrow. I'm sorry, David. I'm not going to be able to to, <laughs> to fix um, some very strong beliefs. But um, people don't like nuance. Nuance is difficult. And it's, it, but it's the truth. Uh, and so that's, that's my response. You just, eventually the truth comes. Uh, Yago, I don't know if you have a, you know, more eloquent response than me on that one. Well, in fact, two weeks ago, I was on a call with um, Udi Wertheimer, and he said to me, okay, cool, but how are you going to convince all the Bitcoiners about this? And I said, well, I'm going to do it one spaces at a time. I'm going to invite every single Bitcoiner to be at home on his spaces, <laughs> and I'm going to talk to him. Um, I, uh, and, you know, I think it's a joke, but in a way it's sort of echoing what you say. We, we need to, and, you know, it's, it's a labor-intensive uh, a, a job of, you know, communicating this message and explaining it. And, um, you know, I think I, I've had, you and I, I think we started out with fairly um, resonant views, but you know, I know that, uh, or at least what you had said to me coming into this call, was that um, you didn't agree and you had suspicions and questions around uh, SOV and sovereign and its tokenomics. I don't know if I've managed to ally those concerns that you have, um, but I think probably based on what you've said, it seems like you view things more similarly to the way we view things now. Uh, is that the case? I, I think that is fair. I think for me to get more, and this is putting my investor hat on, and I'm glad to do this in a public forum, what I would need to do then is view you know, the DCF, where the revenues are coming from, and do I believe those revenues are stable in a, in a downturn uh, based on where the valuation stands today. That's me being honest to everybody. So, yeah. Um, and I think I think I think you can respect that too from where I sit because you do know that I hundred percent. So so I think that would be extremely valuable to us as well, right? And I think to come back to David Saroy's question, I think that's actually the way we do it, right? So if we can shift the debate from uh, is this a shit coin or not to does this DCF analysis make sense? Can you? It, imagine a world in which holding SOV actually earns you Bitcoin, right? I think we're, we're, we enter into a totally different world. And I think it's people like you who can help one way or another. Even, even if you don't, like, e even if you do the analysis and you come to the conclusion that we're out of our minds, <laughs> <you know? laughs> um, I think it would be very, very valuable to publish that analysis. I think I, um, I'll have to check with my uh, – well, I'd never listen to HR. HR doesn't like me very much, but I, I would be happy to do that because I think you're right. I think people need to do more in-depth analysis, and I think that's what Alan and I did on this theoretical. But, you know, SOV is one that's always scratched my head as extremely interesting but with some suspicion, which is what I loved about doing this, uh, this, this podcast. So, yeah. Or, sorry, this Twitter Spaces. <laughs> All right, anyone else? I know there were a couple of requests that I, I accepted if I did it hey, right. I, I have a question real quick. Um, y Yago, you kind of, you, you sort of um, had some critiques around all coins and you specifically mentioned, mentioned seniorage, but I, I'm struggling to see the distinction between all coin and SOV and that same seniorage, right? Because SOV based on the tokenomics looks like it has a 25% f uh, founders fund. So how, how is that type of seniorage any different than any uh, other altcoin? Sure. So uh, let's. Um, so I think it depends on what your definition of seniorage is, right? My definition of seniorage is it is the um, 
uh, the marginal benefit which accrues to what has typically been a sovereign, but really is anyone who is able to issue their own currency. Um, and it is based purely on uh, the fact that they can issue the currency uh, at effectively zero cost um, uh, 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 and, and sell it for whatever the currency is trading at, right? Uh, so that, that to me is seniorage. Now, um, uh, debt or equity or really any other financial instrument doesn't have that property. So, for example, I can create now, you know, uh, a thousand Yago bonds, right, each of which represents a claim on my future revenue, and I could sell them to you maybe. Um, uh, and you would say, well, I mean, that's seniorage. You just went and out of nowhere, you created these tokens, right? Or maybe it's not tokens. Maybe it's little pieces of paper which say I owe you, right? Uh, but it wouldn't be seniorage because the the um, the value that is accruing to you is not uh, 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 directly the monetary asset, but it is a claim to a future to a future monetary asset, right? So this is what. Uh, uh, Big Al is referring to as cash flows or discounted cash flows. Same would be true of, a, of like an equity type uh, thing, right? So with, so, with, with SOV, um, the, the founding team, right? So the, the, the mostly developers, there's some non-developers in it as well, but the, the, the founding set of developers um, who invested, you know, the first months in developing the system, um, have been granted in return for that work uh, a certain portion of the tokens and those tokens are only valuable if indeed our DCF makes sense uh, and they are um, they're locked in with them for, for a three year period uh, and it was very explicit when this was done that this was done as part of the um, as part of the, the, the view towards what good governance looks like, right? So if you look at um, successful startups, for example, they typically tend to be um, founder-run, and they have strong incentives for the first sort of uh, founders uh, to, to remain on board for long periods of time. If you look at what's happening in DeFi, um, uh, so, and sort of what happened previously in the ICO space, um, people start projects and then they typically will leave the project within the space of less than a year. This is extremely common. Uh, we don't think that that's healthy. The second thing is you, 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 you want the most informed people to be making or have substantial influence over decisions. And certainly during the first months and years of the project, the people who are actively building it are going to be probably the most informed people. So <clears throat> uh, our, our, our very clear, and you know, we were explicit about this, we're giving a disproportionate amount of power in the early process uh, to a certain set of people because we think that that is in the best interest of the project and of everyone who is involved in the project. Uh, so, so I, I actually answered the question you didn't ask, which is why they should receive it at all. But you know, the first part of the answer is why. Why don't view that as seniorage? If I may, I'm going to do a very quick addition to it. Is that something that I think Yago and I briefly discussed, and maybe something that I think that layer two, especially building on Bitcoin, might need to get over. And I'm not saying that you know it's perfect how Sovereign did it. Um, like, no offense, uh, Yago. I think it's actually very fair. But when you run a company and you start a company, people do need to be economically incentivized. And what you do like to see is lockup periods. And there's reasons for them to stay because just like Yago said, those are all the smartest. And that is how companies and uh, monetary incentives have run. And I hope that the Bitcoin world makes it more fair. But to me, that is less of a red flag because any of the public companies I've invested in, of course, the founders own you know, XYZ percentage of it and the early team because they dedicate their time and effort. And I don't think that's nece that's not necessarily always bad. It's good that you did your reading and you know exactly what it is. And as Yago mentioned, there there are a lot of scams out there where people will like have no lockup periods and then just dump the token and leave and go create another token. I think that might be a little different than how Sovereign has structured it. 
I want to add one more thing. Can we make for can we make lock up in a such a way that uh, if a uh, coin of the market cap hits X market cap, then this much portion will be unlocked, like Tesla? How Tesla does? Um, it's Maybe actually it's very the... difficult to make changes now to the way the lock up works. We can make it. It's cheaper. perfect how Sovereign did it. Um, like no offense, uh, Yago. I think it's actually very fair. But when you run a company and you start a company, people do need to be economically incentivized. And what you do like to see is lockup periods. And there's reasons for them to stay because just like Yago said, those are all the smartest. And that is how companies and uh, monetary incentives have run. And I hope that the Bitcoin world makes it more fair. But to me, that is less of a red flag because any of the public companies I've invested in, of course, the founders own, you know, X, Y, Z percentage of it and the early team because they dedicate their time and effort. And I don't think that's nece- that's not necessarily always bad. It's good that you did your reading and you know exactly what it is. And as Yago mentioned, there there are a lot of scams out there where people will like have no lockup periods and then just dump the token and leave and go create another token. I think that might be a little different than how Sovereign has structured it. I want to add one more thing. Can we make for can we make lockup in a such a way that uh, if I'm uh, coin of the market cap hits X market cap, then this much portion will be unlocked, like Tesla, how Tesla does. Uh, yeah, um, you're, you're going to have to answer that. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's actually very difficult to make changes now to the way the lockup works. We can make it. It's, 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 it's probably possible. Um, but the... Um, because so so what we consider like one of the first things that was built in fact the first thing that was built and what is considered sort of like the holy of holies is the bitocracy system or the the, the system which governs you know, the protocol and uh, one particularly difficult thing to change there is uh, token allocations uh, or the number of tokens and that's for an obvious reason right you don't you, 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 you don't want uh, a group to be able to easily manipulate or capture the, the governance system of the system, right? So the, the short answer is yes. The long answer is it would, um, it would be a very, very serious root canal, uh, which would require significant uh, development work and uh, 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 sort of like very, very deep order. Yeah, yeah, I got so then we can do in such a way that only 25% of the supply of the allocation you can just give as voting power, right? We can do in that way. That, that, that's, that's already been done, right? So the um, the one, one change that we did manage to introduce uh, is that the um, founders are not eligible for the cash flow. Uh, being distributed until until their vesting periods uh, are over. So you can do it for voting also, right? Voting power. Uh, yes, we can, but we don't want to, right? So the my argument would be, in, you know, the community can choose differently. The voting system is meant to choose by community, right? You are going against community, right? In the, the in the way you are saying. No, I don't think. Look, we we've we've had over thirty-two votes, I think, at this point, uh, and um, I think they've all passed with more than ninety-five percent consensus. And that's because, um, generally, if if there isn't a strong sense of consensus in the community, it doesn't even get to a vote. Um, so I don't think there's been there haven't been any cases where sort of like there's been founders or anything versus the community that that hasn't been a situation that has arisen yet, um, and it's also unlikely to arise because the founders probably disagree with each other more <laughs> than they agree. Um, but um, but I think it's very important. My argument would be that it's very important that the 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 the, the group of people the roughly thirty people who were, who were involved at the beginning continue to be involved and continue to have, at least in the early years of the project, a disproportionate uh, 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 degree of, of interest and sort of uh, voting power in the system. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a question related to this one uh, a little bit. So, so, so thanks, by the way, for the great discussion. Um, I'm really enjoying this. Um, so there was a, the question of uh, why a token and then 
and then there was discussion of uh, well we we need not just sound money but we need sound finance and that creates demands on governance and then the point was uh, uh, Iago that that soft token having a token would help create good good governance and I this is a very basic question and but I sometimes struggle to see how it how it incentivizes good governance it's not it's not as if good choices are rewarded in any way it's not as if you have to be tech savvy to get the token um, so it's it's so uh, it's a very basic uh, basic question just but I, I can see it creates governance by having you know it creates people with skin in the game uh, which incentivizes them to make decisions and to do governance but why how does it create good governance I think that's a really great question. <laughs> Martin, Yaga, am I allowed to jump in here? Because I know he's sure, the sure, to you. sure. But yeah, it, I think it goes back to you know basic game theory and uh, behavioral economics. Is that uh, generally, um, and of course, there are a lot of issues that we're seeing in this industry. But when you have a when you have a token, you have voting rights. You you like you said, Martin. You actually kind of answered, in my opinion, your own question. You have skin in the game which then incentivizes that if you're voting on things that will hurt the ecosystem, you're most likely the price of the SOV token will go down. And so that would be my quick answer. But Yago, I know this is directed to you. Sorry to interrupt you. So, yes, I think the heuristic that you're using, right, which is that skin in the game is, I mean, we can't, certainly in a pseudonymous system, we can't uh, have sort of some kind of test to find out whether or not people are going to make good decisions. And so what we need is we need a sort of um, heuristic, which is going to allow us to to give more weight to people who are going to make better decisions. And, and the, 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 the alignment of economic incentives is what does that. Sovereign is unique. Uh, there's only one other project in the world right now which has Sovereign's uh, governance system, and that's Babelfish. And it's a very unique structure, and I think very, very elegant, because in Sovereign, you, when you, when you, first of all, you, just by being a holder of SOV, you can't participate in governance. You need to stake it. But what that means is that you need to give up liquidity of your token. And the longer you give up liquidity for, the more voting power you get, and concurrently, the more share of revenue you get. Now, what this means is that people who are, who have given up liquidity, who are basically are, are they, 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 they don't just have skin in their game, in the game, they, 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 they cannot escape the game, they're, they're, they're nailed to the game for a long period of time, have the most uh, influence, and but they're also exactly the people who have the most incentive to think um, very carefully about what the long-term interests of the project are. And so you can think of it as kind of like proof of work in a way, right? It's an expensive signal. It's an expensive way of participating. You burn time uh, in order to get votes. Uh, and so um, there's nothing uh, to say that these people are going to make the best decisions, but the the system is designed with a set of instruction, uh, set of incentives which um, encourage them to not just make good decisions, but to make good decisions with a focus on long term outcomes. Now, there's a lot of work that we want to do beyond that. For example, the introduction of prediction markets, the introduction of sub DAOs. Uh, to enhance the decision-making process of the system. And I would go so far as to say that um, what a, any human institution is and what the most successful human institutions will be are systems for making good decisions collectively, right? That, that, that a, 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 good, a good institution is a, is a system which can make good collective decisions. And so if we do our job right with Sovereign, over time what we would be building is the best decision-making machine uh, ever. Can I, can I very briefly just uh, respond? So, so I think on the game theoretic point, uh, I, completely, I can completely see how it creates an incentive not 
to make bad decisions. Uh, but, you know, to have an incentive to make the right decisions is not the same as making the right decisions. Uh, and for good governance, you need those good decisions and not just an incentive to make good decisions. Uh, and, and, and that's, I mean, life and the world around us uh, chooses, uh, it just shows how difficult that step is, uh, although it seems like a small difference in words. Uh, so, yeah, so... I, yeah, no, you're, you're I, totally I, right. Look, I mean, you can um, you can have the very, very worst system in the world, right? Uh, you know, if you think about, um, you know, a democratic system, Democratic systems are not designed for making good decisions, by and large. They're designed for making non-controversial decisions. Um, but every now and again, uh, even democracies will get really, really great leaders. You know? um, the United States is very lucky to get George Washington. Um, the UK was very lucky to get uh, Churchill when they did, right? Um, so having people who are very talented in decision making is is extremely important uh having access to the right data is extremely important uh, there's nothing in sovereign which can promise that it's going to that you know you're going to get the best minds working on the decisions however um, the system is designed to attract a certain kind of people it's designed to attract people who are long-term focused the audience the the user base of sovereign tends to be older than the user base of other platforms. Uh, you know, uh, the user base of Sovereign, I can see just from the discussion we're having here, tends to be very, very thoughtful, uh, tends to be more engaged. Uh, a lot of people who are involved in Sovereign have had very, very uh, significant careers in finance or in um, uh, business, and, and, and their experience shows. Um, and so there's a self-selection process that happens, as well as a structural or an incentive system in place, as well as a, a high degree of transparency, uh, which also we're working constantly to improve. So I think between those three things, you don't guarantee anything, but you can create the environment which is going to give you the highest chance of success over time. Yeah. Hey, Big Al. Thanks for the conversation. Uh, this was very civil. Um, I expected a fight. Um, <laughs> yeah, you asked uh, Yago a question about uh, real-world economic activity, and I think Yago gave a couple of examples. I mean, these are still very early-stage projects, but do you have something in your mind uh, as a Bitcoiner that you would like to see being built or a service that you would like to use? Like, how do you, uh, you know, what do you want to see, um, you know, something built on DeFi which you would like to use? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, and um, I'm glad it wasn't hostile. I do like Yago, even if we might disagree on some minor points. That's that's okay. <laughs> so, um, it, 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 it's a very interesting question. So, look, what, what Yago mentioned with regards to real estate, you know, collateralizing your Bitcoin, I would love that, you know. Um, by the way, I don't consider myself a Bitcoiner. I consider myself a sound tech maximalist. I stole that from Elise Colleen. Um, that that's what I consider myself. But yeah, what I would like to see is things that I know in the future, I would probably like to be a property owner. I'd like to own a home, right? And I'd love to be able to use Bitcoin as collateral uh, for that instead of selling my Bitcoin and, and uh, things like that. So things that enable real economic activity. I'm involved with a company. Um, we might tap the public market soon. We're not tapping the DeFi markets. We're tapping the classic, you file an S1, something like that, potentially, right? Because those public markets enable us to do what we're trying to build at that company. And that's okay. So I'd love to see DeFi mature past. And I, this is not a knock on Sovereign. This is a knock on what my paper knocked on. I'd like to see DeFi mature into a way that I can utilize assets, especially my Bitcoin that I view and I don't want to sell, and I can use it as collateral. I can do lending markets. I can, you know, in that in that sort of way. And especially, um, I'm getting a little theoretical here because it is something I'm trying to help build out. But you know, with the way the Lightning Network works, uh, Yago mentioned it. There's a lot of liquidity needs. So instead of a company, you know, having to sell a percentage of their equity to get to then just buy Bitcoin, you know, 
perhaps we can create a DeFi where you can lend that Bitcoin because they need the liquidity provision to work on Lightning. Um, these are real issues that are starting to come up for companies trying to build on Lightning. So, so net net, my answer to you, it's a, it's a great question, but my answer to you is I'd like to see my ability to use the assets that I hold for constructive means in the real world and economic value. And so far, I would say, and Yago, please jump in here. I would say 99% of the quote unquote volume, even though I think most of it's fake and wash trading on DeFi is just people trading tokens for other tokens. And that isn't real value to me. So th I think Yago pointed out some of the things like real estate and whatnot. But we, I, I'd like to see the build out of a more robust capital market in the next decade. I think we can get there. And I actually, funny enough, think Sovereign will be one of the pioneers of helping us get there. Not to give Yago a nice little tap on the back, but <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop it there unless, Yago, you have something to add. Or uh, just what you th what you think of it as a tap on the back? I feel it's like oh fuck! Now I have some more responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to fix the financial system now, Yago. No pressure. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree with everything you said. Um, Yasim, uh, Jasim, sorry for mispronouncing your name. Did you have any follow up to that, or did that answer your question? Yeah, my my name is Prince. <laughs> Oh okay. no. <laughs> yeah, do you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I, I want to yeah to 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 complement what um, big AI say, and which relate to the the comment that uh, Iago made relating to real estate. And um, I I would first like to thank Iago for this project because I think it's an amazing project, and um, I I think that. Uh, um, you, you, you know, he, he talks about real estate, and, and I think that I experienced this using my Bitcoin as collateral on, on, um, on MakerDAO using a WBTC. And when I saw the, 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 the server platform and all the projects around, I understood that uh, this is the real platform where this has to happen. And I, I think that it is time now we, we really connect Bitcoin to, to real world, to to real economy and and this is something that i experienced because me i've mentioned a big ai i built part of my house using my bitcoin as collateral and i use local enterprises that i hire to to build some stuff in house and i i pay with die that i borrow uh using my bitcoin as collateral so I, 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 would ju I, I just wanted to add about it and to say that I think that this is uh, an amazing project. Uh, and um, I, I wanted to ask Iago if they have any plan to improve, for example, the user experience. Because I think that for people who know Bitcoin, who know cryptocurrencies, we don't care when we see what we see. But I think that for newcomers, sometimes this can be scary to see, for example, a platform like Sovereign. It's, uh, it's really strange. And I wanted to ask you if you have any plan to improve the, the, the user interface to make it more friendly for newcomers. 100% yes. I think, uh, you know, anyone who's been following Sovereign uh, has probably noticed that, uh, you know, that this, w w the way we, uh, we've been operating is we've been pushing stuff out before it's ready. Uh, and then iterating, iterating, iterating. And one of the big pieces that has been um, constantly updating is the the UI and the front end. I think where we would like to get to, and I think this is also an opportunity for our, um, other teams, right, is to get to a you know to to to, to look at some of the products, like for example. Uh, some of the use cases, right? The the ability to take um, your Bitcoin and borrow, uh, so that you can you can make a payment to someone to build a house, for example, right? That's like one very specific use case, and it would be good to have a UI that basically allowed you to do that with two buttons, right? Click, click. Um, it, uh, and so I think we, we, what we'll start to see is a proliferation of. Um, UIs that are very that are separate from sort of like the big 
you know, overview, imp reference implementation depth, and are more specific to one particular thing that a user might want to do, even if they don't know anything. All right. Anyone else? Uh, there was a silence, so I'll to take advantage of it. I think one of the big things that we'd also like to see is, you know, deeper integration into Bitcoin wallets, into Lightning Network wallets, uh, to make it really, really easy um, for people to access the, the parts that they want through the interfaces that they're already familiar with. So I just wanted to say that I think it's um, a no-brainer that a platform like so Sovereign should exist, especially as Bitcoin matures and there's like more of a need to um, build on top of it and as more happenings occur. Um, I just wanted to ask if Yago could speak speak a little about RSQ and why Sovereign is built on RSQ. Sure. So uh, I, I think what you so I would differentiate between RSK, which is a company, uh, and uh, a company which has no, 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 that's fine. But RSK is a company which has been. Um, which, which which built out the the original version and, and the primary you know has been maintaining rootstock and rootstock is the technology and rootstock is i think fantastic technology um very very important uh addition to bitcoin in in lots of ways but what it does is it allows us to have a side chain for bitcoin which is secured by Bitcoin miners, which uses Bitcoin as the base asset, but allows Bitcoin, it's basically like Bitcoin with superpowers, right? So it's Bitcoin that can interact um, trustlessly with smart contracts, with other tokens, uh, and with all of the various use cases that we've discussed today. Um, and, uh, and, and this general principle of being able to build side chains that can have functionality that we wouldn't want to put into um, Bitcoin main chain allows us to basically add any functionality that we want to Bitcoin without polluting main chain and at the same time because these side chains they pay transaction fees to Bitcoin miners actually increase the security budget of Bitcoin which becomes increasingly important as the as the Bitcoin uh, subsidy is reduced and I uh, I think actually uh, that it's very likely uh, and probably th the best we can hope for in many ways is that the majority of Bitcoin miner uh, revenue in the future will come from side chains rather than from main chain transactions because main, tra main chain transactions are, are going to be relatively limited. But that would also help keep Bitcoin secure without the need for the settlement transactions on main chain to become absurdly expensive. Um, and as somebody who um, helps with a a, uh, a miner, um, I I do agree with that sentiment. Um, so, just sitting in that chair. <laughs> yeah, that that makes sense a lot. Of, that makes sense to me. Thank you for talking about it. We also so, have someone. Yeah, just uh, yeah, big. Can I? Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, big Al, so you just said that you are helping a miner. So, why do you think so far uh, there has been not as as much um, acceptance or adoption of uh, rootstock? Is it just because of economic activity, or is there some just I don't know a lack of awareness, or what is it? Um, I actually don't have a good answer for you, so I'm not going to give one because I actually don't. I I actually don't know why there hasn't been as much acceptance. I mean, it might just be the economic activity of it. I believe would be the best answer, but maybe Yago can actually give you a better answer. So I apologize, but I don't want to act like I know something that I don't. Um, I think economic activity is the primary driver, but I think there's you know a broader so you know. There was very little activity at all on Rootstock until just a few months ago. Um, today, the vast majority of it is sovereign. Um, so there really wasn't a reason to. But also, you know, as we can see in the course of this conversation, I think there's a, 
the fights that we need to have, right? We need to educate ourselves as Bitcoiners. We need to educate our community about the fact that this even exists and why it's important and why it's good. And I think that, that, that you know, it's those two things. I'd, I'd love to ask one, one other question. Uh, Big Al, uh, a couple times throughout this um, um, spaces, you kind of critiqued like Sovereign's tokenomics. You said, ah, well, like no offense, like, but the tokenomics like weren't ideal. Like, can you maybe elaborate on that? Like, are you talking about the emission schedule, the distribution of the tokens? Like, like, what did you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, okay, so let's start from the base. Uh, what I first meant was I saw a token, I immediately was suspicious, which is maybe a little unfair of me. <laughs> um, second is that what I need to do is a, you know, if, if this token is going to accrue value, it's going to accrue value via a simple discounted cash flow model that accrues it on a, you know, a Bitcoin basis, right? And then the, the third question I have, and I've discussed with Iago privately too, is that the activity that is currently going on on the Sovereign platform, is it just tokens being traded for tokens and people lending, or is it actually connected to real-world economic value? Because then if I model out in the future years, let's say we go into a bear market, in a bear market, all these DeFi platforms, the volumes will go down dramatically. And so, you know, what is my discount rate on, you know, the value of that sovereign token and those cash flows that I can expect as a holder of the sovereign token? When it came to distribution and lockup, I, I you know, I've, I've read through and I think I think they've done a. I would say very good job actually on the way that they've locked up the tokens, incentivized the founders and developers. For me, it's actually frankly another step of work of getting comfort on that sort of model that I want to build. And it actually could be fun from this conversation. It could be fun if I built it out and actually published it. And I'd obviously clear it by Yago before if that's okay or whatnot, but that, that could be a fun exercise. I do have a lot on my plate, but that, that could be a that could be a fun one. But that that was my main concern, David. Did that um did that sort of uh, address your question? Yeah, it did. It makes sense. And if you want to DM me afterwards, I, I mean, I've been doing some high level analysis on the cash flow. I'm happy to help out if you know. You oh, I love that. All that stuff. I love that. Yeah, totally. Let's do it. So, Sweet. All right, sounds good. Yeah, I'll go. Any input? We're gonna we're gonna tell Sovereign is worth ten ten trillion dollars. <laughs> I think you'd be off by a factor of 10. I just can't say in which direction. Okay. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Anybody else? Yeah, we had another question here on the chat from uh, one dude who's at a crowded restaurant. Uh, so you said yeah, makes a compelling case for uh, a steak uh, when it comes to sovereign. Uh, the, the governance mechanisms and everything, uh, and he's asking why uh, this proof of stake work or it could work for Sovereign and not for other protocols like Ethereum or anything else. I think it's an excellent question, um, uh, and I think about it a lot uh, in two ways. First of all, I'm not sure I would describe <clears throat> Sovereign exactly as a proof of stake system. Um, uh, because, or maybe I, may, or maybe the more correct thing to say is that is, sovereign is maybe the only proper proof of stake system, <laughs> because it's not the number of tokens that you have; it's how much you have staked in a very real way, and for what period of time. Um, and the reason I think there, the the, the big difference is. Um, a question of, of design goals. So the, the reason I think having um, incentivized parties, so economically incentivized parties able to wield economic power in the system for the purpose of decision making in uh, sovereign is because sovereign is a totally different type of institution from uh, Bitcoin, right? So sovereign is designed to be a, um, you know, what we would call in technology an application layer, uh, or what we would call in, um, uh, you know, government a regulatory layer, right? So if you, maybe one way to think about sovereign is, sovereign is, is, is the regulator of a borderless financial world, right? Uh, it, it, the, 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 the sovereign community together make decisions such as, will we allow 
decentralized, uh, sorry, will we allow centralized stable coins into our system? Uh, will we uh, allow the risky lending, right? Th those are um, decisions that already the sovereign community is making. So effectively, it's a jurisdiction that is self-regulating. Uh, and so it's designed to have human input and human decision making. Uh, now, let's uh, think about that in relation to the United States, for example, right? I think a lot of people believe that it makes sense to have a financial regulator. Um, and the same people who think it makes sense to have a financial regulator think it makes no sense to have a Federal Reserve. I, I would be one of those people, right? I think um, you want government. You want a government that is able to say, um, you know, fraud is bad. But you don't want a government that, can, that is able to say, we're going to print, print four and a half trillion dollars this year. So the monetary institution should be unmanipulable and neutral because it is a measuring stick. It should be, you know, non-human, non-arbitrary, and uh, the regulator needs to be more active and needs to be able to make more active decision making. And so I think proof of stake makes sense uh, when you want to be able to make decisions and proof of work makes sense when you want to limit decision making. All right, Steve, I hope that answered your question. Um, do we have uh, more people from the crowd who want to ask questions? I don't know for how long uh, do we have our uh, guests here, Iago and uh, Big Al. Let's, I, I think we can maybe stick around for another nine minutes uh, okay. if, if Big Al's okay, because then I don't, I don't want to ask too much of him. That's no, that that is okay with me. My my hard stop is two thirty, but two o'clock would be good to rest up before that one. So <laughs> that's okay with me. And good. All right. So, do you have any more sovereigns here looking to ask questions? Shoot them to Yagor or Bigal. In the meanwhile, before asking, you can go to our Twitter profile and follow us if you haven't done so, and go to Sovereign website, check it out, maybe start swapping, trading, and follow us on all social media networks. Just go to sovereign.app, S-O-V-R-Y-N.app, scroll to the bottom, and you'll see all of our social media profiles. Or you can connect, ask your questions, uh, check out the guides, everything that you need, we're here for you. When do you think zero sale is going to come? To Yago. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, so zero just so that everyone knows, is the, uh, is the system which has been built and is going to be rolled out soon to allow people to start taking um, loans against their Bitcoin collateral at 0% interest into perpetuity. And I think it's going to be a game changer. Um, there has been some talk about tokenizing it. Uh, and indeed, a SIP was passed to tokenize it. Um, I uh, have had a number of conversations over the course of, the, of December and primarily... Um, you know, the, the Christmas period with a lot of people uh, about whether or not it makes sense to separate this as a separate token, right? The idea to have a separate token for this was because it, to, to give it basically its own um, governance system. But if this becomes systemically important to sovereign, you may, you may want it to be governed directly by SOV. And so... Um, Interesting that you asked this question today because there was a, a, a meeting um, uh, of, of, of a large number of contributors um, but, you know, from the core team today discussing that topic exactly, uh, where maybe it would make sense to delay uh, the decision around zero until we've, after we've launched the system and had some opportunity to observe how uh, users are using it. And if Yago tokenizes it, don't worry, I'll be a huge pain in, in his, uh, well, I won't say it, <laughs> but I'll make sure to, 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 to look at how that tokenomics is working. <laughs> so, uh, so where does the fees go, liquidation fees go then if there is no governance system or no token? Well, they would go directly to the protocol and then be distributed to SOB stakers. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. 
I can ask another question if there are no other questions. Um, yeah, Yago, uh, I uh, I think there was in some space that you mentioned that uh, roll-ups would, I mean, in your opinion, roll-ups would be the only change that might need to be uh, made to Bitcoin, uh, and then you know everything can be done off-chain. Um, but you know, anytime there is any discussion of Bitcoin um, having some other functionality, any smart functionality, the, there is the, there are a couple of SIPs, uh, BIPs, sorry, uh, 300, 100 and 301 regarding drive chain. Yeah, drive chain, that comes up quite a lot. So what is your view on that? Um, so I, I think drive chain would be a great idea. Yeah in pretty much every single way except for one. Um, drive chain is a way for um, us to create um, trustless pegs or very, very near to trustless pegs um, as part of the core protocol of, uh, of the core Bitcoin protocol, which allows us to have, you know, side chains, uh, um, you know, with basically the same or very, very similar assurances or as close as you could imagine assurances to Bitcoin main chain. Uh, uh, and then, you know, BIP301 would also have blind merge mining, which reduces the load and makes merge mining, um, reduces the, the computational load on, on, on miners. They don't need to know anything about the sidechain that they're mining, which allows you to have more side chains more easily. Um, the one uh, issue I have with BIP, oh, and then BIP300 also has another big advantage, which is it's been around for a long time. It's pretty well developed. There's been quite a bit of testing around it. Uh, and Paul Stork is the primary developer around it. Uh, and, and, and there's a good guy to follow. <clears throat> here's here's my, my biggest concern with, uh, with BIP300. I think that there's uh, a better way. Uh, I think that having um, zero knowledge proofs being um, being the method of creating trustless pegs is a more elegant, uh, cleaner uh, solution um, and didn't exist until very, very recently and still requires additional work. Um, and I hate to put myself in the position where I'm, you know, the kind of person who would say, uh, you know, let's, let's sacrifice the good for the perfect. But um, in this particular case, I think we're so, we, we, we already have an alternative, which I actually think is superior to, to BIP 300. Although um, I think there are people who have examined the, the, this closer than me and they, you know, don't necessarily agree with me, but, but that's sort of my intuition. Um, but you know, I think the, 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 what it basically comes down to is I think uh, the, the, the Bitcoin, if Bitcoin develops a way for us to have trustless pegs with Bitcoin sidechains, it's, it's, it, it's so future proofs Bitcoin that it's, it, and it so reduces the pressure to add additional changes to main chain in the future. It's like the best thing we could do so that 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 is what we should as a community be coming together and trying to figure out how we make that happen that that should be our mission i think all right so i think that with that uh good question for rapid night was a really good conversation um and really as as most people here said we were expecting a flaming uh debate and it turns out that we're mostly in agreement here. Uh, so it's good to see. And Bigal, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, Iago, again, as always, uh, for you know, t taking us from, from the start to the beginning. Um, in such a nice manner. <laughs> <laughs> That's not very successful if I just take you from the start to the beginning. <laughs> and, and, and then to the moon. And then to the moon. You always end in the moon. <laughs> We're in treading water here, guys. Yeah. All right, well, well I always, uh, Yago and Sovereign team and all the listeners, look, I always appreciate it. And I know everyone was expecting a, a fist fight. Maybe Yago and I can get in the boxing ring someday. But, um, 
you know, I, I always respect the work. I, I'm still going to question things. Maybe uh, uh, David, one of the, the the guests here and I will do a DCF uh, <laughs> and we'll do that. But I'm, I'm not surprised that it wasn't a fist fight, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> people are a little more dramatic than they need to be on Twitter, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, that's always the case. All right, so thanks, everyone. Thanks to all of our listeners. Um, and stay sovereign. Yago, final words? I think you said it, man. Stay sovereign. Have a great <laughs> one, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.